Welcome to the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic thinking from your friends at the Foundation for Economic Education. My name is Richard Lawrence, and we are here today with a larger panel than usual, which we'll get to in a moment. We've got Brittany Hunter, Dan Sanchez, Mary Ann March, and our special guest, Anna Jane Peril, who has been on the FeeCast before and is coming fresh off of a successful seminar season. So I'm sure you're very energized at this very moment. Or very sleepy. Oh, yeah. No, it's uh, it's been a very busy summer. Um, we just finished up all of our seminars, which are, I mean, every week of the summer is we are in some city somewhere in the country teaching over usually over 100 kids. Um, some, you know, We have entrepreneurship-themed camps. We have um, leadership-themed camps. We also have economics in your daily life, which is what we do, you know, what we do at FEE. We love economics. We love applying it to everything. Um, so we, yeah, we've, we finally wrapped up seminar season, and I am so thankful. So it's good that you're with four others because that allows you to kind of play off of our energy. and Yes, give me some of your energy, yes. The we will, children we will have direct taken it, it in that me. way. <laughs> yeah. So the fun thing that we're able to announce today is that you are going to be joining us full-time on the FeeCast, which Yay. is extremely <laughs> exciting. That news is, however, bittersweet, and that is because, Brittany, you are going to be relocating to D.C. I am. And no longer on the FeeCast regularly. No, I will not be on the FeeCast regularly, but I'll pop in every now and then. I can't leave you guys to have all the fun by yourselves. So, yeah, but it's been so much fun talking economics with you guys every week. So I will I will miss you. And you'll be writing for Fee.org quite of a course. bit. Of course, yeah. In fact, I learned so much from Fee that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So starting my own writing business and going to branch out and see what happens. So, That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> We're excited to see all the upcoming writing that you're going to have for us. And then eventually when the time comes for you to rejoin, and guest, <laughs> guest appear. Um, and so, Brittany, you are not the only uh, thing that is being banned out of Atlanta no. these days. No. <laughs> uh, We're going to have a conversation today about other things that are being uh, unceremoniously left go- let go out of our lives, banned without any type of real discussion, it seems. And this is all being brought about by, of course, we all know, plastic straws. They are, it seems, all of a sudden, no longer with us. And there are all kinds of other bands as well. And these are, this is an interesting approach to take uh, Mm -hmm. when people disagree with something, is to just say, all right, let's go to the government, let's go to the local city council and just say, no more. It's all gone. Yeah, well, we're definitely seeing this with Starbucks. They've vowed that in their stores globally by 2020, that they're going to eliminate straws and they're switching over to these weird adult sippy cup plastic lids. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence that Starbucks is based in Seattle and then mm-hmm. Seattle recently banned straws. Mm-hmm. And they, there was like a whole campaign, Strawless in Seattle. Hmm. Uh, and cele- that is kind name. of clever. Yeah. I, I do yeah. like that. However, that clever title comes with a $250 fine in Seattle for straw usage. So wow. is it great. the person who uses the straw who's being so fined? So no one seems to know that yet, which I think is going to be really interesting Still to, TBD. See, to see play out in court because Santa Barbara just banned straws, but they didn't only ban plastic straws. They banned um, the cardboard, the terrible... I think terrible cardboard straws that they're, that they're giving people these days. So like cylinders, they're just banding they're banning like cylinders. Cylinders. <laughs> a geometric shape. But instead shape. of just yeah. a 250 fine, which actually sounds pretty good compared to their thousand dollar fine, they've also added uh, it's an infraction per straw. So if I give you a straw and I give you a straw, that's two thousand dollars or six months of jail time, which is actually twelve months of jail time because it's two counts. Are we wow. also outlawing straw bartering? So if I've got a bunch yeah. of straws and you have a goat, can I not can trade, trade you for the goat? <laughs> it's not off the table. Yeah, no. so is the infraction the the purchase of it's it's literally just the exchange of currency for a straw? No, because they're not purchasing it. This is purchasing a drink and then saying and then, I want a straw. And it makes me wonder if they're gonna start doing sting operations, like a cop going in there and saying, Give me a straw yes. and seeing like can't. with underage alcohol. Exactly. Right. As a yeah. server, you know this. We've we've had that. That's yes. with cops too. Um and so it is it's unclear as to how this is going to be enforced because it does sound yeah. Like nothing's off the table. Well, the interesting thing is the difference between banning the straws versus alcohol restrictions are the alcohol restrictions are directly correlated to the breaking of a law. If you, as a server or bartender, serve somebody too much and that person gets into an accident or they drive under the influence, they're committing a crime. Or if you're serving right. a minor, technically right. they're committing a crime by consuming alcohol. In this case, there's no crime against drinking out of a 
drinking a drink out with a straw. Sucking is now illegal. You cannot suck. (laughs) (laughs) So do your best. (laughs) And of course, this is coming on the heels of many, many years, it seems, of banning various things like plastic bags, Mm -hmm. even paper bags. I was up in Chicago a week ago, and it's not a full ban, but I was at Whole Foods. I had my suitcase in hand. I'm buying groceries for a few days Mm -hmm. at Whole Foods. And before they even ring anything up at all, zero dollars for the total, but 14 cents for tax for two paper bags. And so, you know, of course, that's not a ban, but this is sort of following in sort of a movement of various things that we don't like collectively being abolished by government. Yeah, and especially not just plastics, but single-use plastics, Mm -hmm. that that's like the big enemy. That's the whole Mm -hmm, idea here. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it happened super quick. I literally was on vacation this weekend, and it's the first time I'd heard about a stainless steel straw because my dad was talking about them and how amazing they are. And then I go into a coffee shop the next day, and they're selling them, and they don't have any other straws. And I'm just like, what is going on? Like, this world, it came so quick, you know? It did. It's. I had to ask a friend earlier today. I was saying, you know, what precipitated this? Why did it happen Mm -hmm. so very quickly? And it's being written about by many, many different outlets, including by Vox, not as we're banning plastic straws because we don't like plastic straws or necessarily even that it's going to save the ocean, but they're calling it a gateway ban. Yeah, gateway plastic, Mm -hmm. gateway ban, basically saying, well, okay, if we can get get straws taken out, then we can get the next single-use plastic, you know, thing banned. Not realizing these things are not all causing us damage. I mean, there are good things about plastic, so it's it's very outrageous. Well, and also in that article, they talk about how banning plastics is in vogue. And I thought that that word was interesting, in vogue, yes. that it really is kind of like a fad, yeah. like a faddish thing. Like eating cottage cheese in the 80s. Right. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is health. This is what health is. Like, oh, this is, we're saving the world by not having plastic. Yeah. 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 It's yeah, interesting. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, it's interesting how many strong feelings people have about straws. I mean, mm-hmm. there's people who are really concerned about the environmental implications of this. I think we all saw the picture of the turtle with plastic straw yeah. and snow. The tortoise. The tortoise, is which tortoise, is sad. I feel, I feel, you know, badly <laughs> for these animals. But it's funny because you have the people like your dad who are really into the metal straws, mm-hmm. people who feel opinions about paper straws. And interestingly, I have opinions about you paper have opinions. straws. McDonald's, um, similar to Starbucks, announced that they are going to switch over to paper straws in the UK mm. and not Ireland. Here. UK and Ireland by next year. Okay, so let's not been. break that news for the United States quite yet. I don't know if any of us could handle that. <laughs> no, I would love it. Well, that's another debate. Is like, I love paper straws. You guys all hate them. I don't understand. Well, they fall <laughs> apart. They disintegrate when you're drinking. We're, we go down to Ted's just down the street. They have these for years. Do you drink mm-hmm. a drink or do you hang out with it? You're not like standing there all day. Oh, you Come have on, to you hang out drink with it. Throw it away. Hang out with your drink. Well, Come on, guys. Well, that's, but that's the thing. Utilitarian. That, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing that's kind of infuriating about the statement that it's voguish or in vogue mm-hmm. to ban plastic straws because are we seriously governing by fashion? Right. And it seems mm-hmm. like the answer is yes. Right. Yeah, it's that's the big difference between like cottage cheese being like in fashion in the 80s. It's like <laughs> like that's your personal choice that yes. that is the trend where mm-hmm. it's like oh well banning this activity is so trendy nowadays yeah. it's like oh we, we we have this like fashion oh have you seen the latest thing we've banned um that's just ridiculous that that like infringing on someone else's rights shouldn't be a, a, a trend yeah yeah well we used to talk about what efforts we could make as individuals f- towards environmentalism mm. use reusing you know water bottles and recycling recycling if you had a plastic device holding your soda cans together, that you would cut that plastic piece up so that it doesn't end up in the wild, inconveniencing mother nature and animals and stuff. And so we would just cut them up. There's there's steps that you can do to reduce your impact. Until we went from zero to 100 all of a sudden with plastic straws. Which yeah. is through the logic of city councils. We were talking mm-hmm. about this earlier that these small city council bodies are getting together and, you know, urgency meeting. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Straws. <laughs> but they're able to do a lot of damage, which also makes me think you could do a lot of good on a city council, but we're not seeing that. All these bans are happening at the city level. Has anyone ever sort of considered that? You know, of course, because straws are no longer at Starbucks. They've been a market actor in getting rid of plastic straws at their stores. Has anyone ever considered that maybe because they're beginning to offer these flavored straws, that there's like a flavored straw cartel that's (laughs) beginning to actually get itself into the whole market almost by force? The paper Uh, straw industrial complex. Yes. (laughs) They're here. Big flavor straw. Big straw. (laughs) Out in Washington. Big straw. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now Starbucks is offering sippy cups, so it could be like big yeah. sippy cup. 
They do look like <laughs> sippy cups. Uh, so we're going to take a quick break real quick, and we're going to get back and talk a little bit more about these ideas in depth right after that break. Hi, I'm Sean Malone, Director of Media for Fee.org. Of course, you already know about Fee's incredible articles and written content. But did you know that you can also watch our fantastic videos and listen to our podcast at our website as well? Visit fee.org slash shows to get the latest content from the series you love, such as Out of Frame, Common Sense Soapbox, How We Thrive, The Words and Numbers Podcast, and, of course, The FeeCast. Once again, that's fee.org slash shows for more great content like this. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to the FeeCast. We are talking about that most exciting of topics today, and that is straws, plastic and otherwise. And the question that I have now is, why are we as a society, as citizens, as a culture now banning straws? What is the impetus for this? Well, I think it stems from a concern for the impact that people may or may not be having on the planet. There's a lot of talk about climate change, and I think if we think about our own behaviors, yeah, I probably throw away things that I could maybe take an extra step to recycle or to reuse, repurpose. And, and you know, there's a lot of stories about how much plastic is in the water. So I did a little digging before, the, before this episode, and I found out that, according to Time Magazine, there's estimates that we are releasing about 8 million metric tons each year into the ocean of plastic and microplastics. That's everything altogether. That's straws, it's bags, mm -hmm. it's junk otherwise, it's the little plastic beads that are inside your exfoliator. Yes, yes, that's, that's all of it. And there's concern about these patches in the ocean of concentrated plastic debris. A lot of times it's microplastic, but it's swirling around. And people even point to a large patch that lies between California and Hawaii. It's about the size of Texas, according to these estimates. Wow. And the visuals are compelling. When you see the visuals, like satellite images, it's just garbage floating mm -hmm. there. Well, and speaking of visuals, like statistics don't necessarily have purchase on the human heart, but uh, images do and videos do. And mm -hmm. there was one particular viral video of a turtle with a straw lodged in its nostril. nostril. Yes. And how much of that do you think plays into the, the sort of the moral panic over straws? So I was thinking that, and I, again, I said like this happened at least from my perspective super quickly. Like sure. I just found out about it this weekend. I, when you really think about it, I, uh, I feel like this happened in response to criticism I've heard of what's called like selectivism, where you basically just like tweet about something you hate right. or you, you know, post it on Facebook or whatever. Um, I think that people are at least now self-aware that that's, that's not enough. Um, so now we're going to take action. And this is one of the few ways. I mean, we can't we can't solve access to water in developing countries as an individual. That's how it feels. It feels like we can't solve these incredible problems. But if I can be like, yeah, no straws, like I can just not use a straw. Well, I can support policy that doesn't use straws. Think starting small, I think, makes people feel good. It makes them feel like they're doing something. In a know? climate where you might be upset who the president is or yes, who's in Congress yeah, and yeah. you can't do anything about that mm -hmm. because... Uh, People are just so tense about everything. Yeah. The world is such a sucky place right now. Literally, I see memes about, you know, the world's burning down every day. Um, and I think that this little, you know, let's grasp our little straws and let's try <laughs> to feel yeah. like we can straws. change something. And yeah. I, I think maybe because it's visual and because mm -hmm. you see it's something that a change that you can see in just people walking around. It's like, oh, I don't see people with straws walking around like I used to. I've done something. I've made some sort of sort of a change. But then again, like what kind of change, like how, how much of a change and, and is it actually to the good? And what you talk about, like how quickly it happened also right. really interests me too, is just the psychology of it. It was the same thing with me that like, I barely heard about it for the first time and already it was a done deal. Mm -hmm. Like already, mm -hmm. okay, straws are on the way out. Like yeah. this, this thing that was just <laughs> part of our lives that you just take for granted, then nope, no more straws. It makes and me wonder too. Oh, sorry. It, it makes me wonder what meaning are people missing in their lives? And it yeah. is so important to have a purpose, to have a higher mm -hmm. meaning. 
But when your your main purpose is taking my straw away or not just not letting me choose whether or not I would like to use the straw, right. I think that's problematic. I think it's marginality contributed to the snowball effect. It's that it's 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 a marginal difference in our lives, but it affects so many of us. Like you said, you see people with straws all the time and now all of a sudden they're gone. And it's just it's a minor inconvenience and we all think about it, we all interact with this object so frequently that I think that's what contributed to the snowball effect. That it's like, okay, this is something we can all really truly grasp, literally, figuratively, and save the world. And I wonder if it's because because of the inconvenience that people yeah. like it. Like, mm. I think there's sort of a, a puritanical aspect to cer certain schools of environmentalism yeah. mm -hmm. where it's like, if you're suffering, then that is a sign of, of virtue. Mm -hmm. Suffering for the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That if sacrifice, doing sacrifice. Without, mm -hmm. Or, or, you know, and, and go back to like the 80s and 90s, or even just like Burke's ugly clothing, unfashionable clothing, because it's cool to worry more about the environment. You're a little bit yes, more something out yeah. of pimp rather than cotton because it's mm -hmm. it's cool. You know, it's, so it's funny. It, it becomes more of a fashionable even, thing. Yeah, yeah veganism based on resource management, yeah. too, is like, oh, I'm, I am. I'm, I'm making my life harder and not as fun mm -hmm. so that I can do something good. Because of all the cow yeah. farts, right? Yeah. That's pretty much it. <laughs> I don't want to tell anybody to stop trying to be cool, stop trying to be fashionable. But don't tell me how to be fashionable or cool or whether or not I should use a straw. Maybe empower me to make my own choice. You can tell me about how straws can have a negative impact on the environment and maybe I will then choose differently and it'll be more powerful because I've decided for myself and am more likely to stick to it in that case. It'll be real. It'll be, you know, Bastia talks about this with false philanthropy and forcing other people to give to the poor, right? But if the person mm -hmm. they're stealing that money from to give to the poor has no feelings towards the poor, you're not creating a moral person, you're yeah. just creating a bitter person by stealing from them. Mm -hmm. And again, speaking to how quickly it happened, it used to be that when we would have these moral panics, it would take a while for it to build up and it would have to be like a huge portion of the population mm -hmm. who got swept in up in it before something wa was banned, yeah. be before like a, a drug was banned or, um, but, but it seemed like Again, we, we follow the news. Like, I, I follow the news quite a lot as an editor. Yeah. And yet I didn't even, it d didn't get on my radar. And so just thinking of the average person, the average person has no even opinion one way or the other mm -hmm. about this, hasn't even thought about it. But already it has been enough of a groundswell just among a certain elite that, that um, it's mm -hmm. actually happening. It's actually being banned. It's ha and, and even the corporate policies that, that Starbucks is phasing it out and that kind of thing. I it's think just... a lot of this is because news travels so quickly, too. Mm -hmm. When you're when you can tweet mm -hmm. something you're angry about and then hashtag <laughs> environmentalism and then everybody's following you like it can happen. But so again, quickly. it doesn't have to travel that quickly throughout everyone. All it has to right. do just is a few people. Yeah. Right. A few yeah. people with power. Yeah. And there like are a few the things to council. unpack here. Right. So there there's the dynamic of. Starbucks actually making this decision autonomously, maybe getting ahead of a regulation that they sensed was on the way mm -hmm. and leading leading that charge, right? And then having these sippy cup kind of <laughs> holders or, or tops rather for the cup, they had a little while actually to consider it. You know, they were able to figure out how to procure these sippy cup type tops. So there's the market sort of leading in that way. There's also the local aspect of Santa Monica and other local towns who are deciding to do this through law, through regulation, which we're obviously criticizing. But it goes to your point about people feel, uh, you know, without power on the national level. So they're going to the local level and doing something they think they actually have some sort of say in. Mm -hmm. And I think your, your point about sort of social media also is great because we're so divided right now. It almost seems to me like, you know, the crowd that went out and said we need to ban these straws uh, didn't care one way or the other what, what anyone else had to say. They wanted to do it. We're so divided now that there's no mm -hmm. sense listening to anyone with opposing opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's dangerous. Doubling mm -hmm. down on what could potentially be mis, mis or, you know, not factual just because you want to be so committed to something. And we're seeing that, I think, on all, all sides of the aisle. Well, it's populism, right? It's yeah. governing by fad. Mm -hmm. It's basically whenever you get yes. a bunch of people together who tend to have a similar grievance, in this case, it might be something about the environment. They come together, they speak in one sort of voice of the mob and they get something done whether or not it's been deliberated on properly. Well, and that's the frustrating part. I think for me, I want to A, celebrate the beauty of the internet, right? That we could come together and this could happen so quickly. We want that. We want the spread powerful. of information to happen. It's it's when it informs us, it becomes dangerous when it affects our how we govern people yes. because it that's taking away people's rights, putting them in jail for six months for having a straw. I'm totally fine with people being outraged about straws as people, but not mm -hmm. when they have authority over 
decisions that straw we make. shaming I, should I, be allowed <laughs> yeah it's true. yeah I, yeah i, I, I think agree. that's an important point one a podcast that we uh another podcast words and numbers uh this week's episode talks about what uh, when, whenever someone says there ought to be a law, mm-hmm. what that means. Yeah. The <laughs> fact that every law is enforced at the barrel of, of mm-hmm. a gun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And every law to be enforced, you have to be willing to incarcerate, to cage someone. Yes. And then yeah. if they're not willing to be caged over that infraction, ultimately to, to, to kill them. And it's, <laughs> it's important to, to remember that, that whenever you say that, Whenever you say, oh, you can't sell straws or you can't offer straws to back that up, that there, that means literal imprisonment, the like real threat li- of violence. Or, yeah. Yeah. or yeah. death at the very worst case, you know, extreme. Mm-hmm. Peer pressure really should be the way that we go about these things. That's well, how I exactly. feel. Exactly. Instead of resorting to regulation yeah. as the first method of action, mm-hmm. as the first resort, it should be the final result or resort rather when things are bad. People aren't making maybe the right decisions. We're making ethical lapses, moral uh, uh, lapses. That that then should be maybe the metric by mm-hmm. which we evaluate whether we should take some sort of other action other than straw shaming. Yeah. yeah. At least a presumption of liberty. Like, uh, uh, you know, I, I would have it where, like, you know, banning is off the table. Yeah. But at least don't have it be the first resort. Dan mm-hmm. would ban banning. <laughs> <laughs> well, ban banning. Before we achieve the Dan total the ban, banishment ban. of banning, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back after these messages. Oh, boy, you know, starting out in the, in the music business or in just any business, you have to have the carrot dangling. You have to know what your goals are. I think if anybody goes in without a goal, you're pretty much doomed. This is a family business. My daughters son-in-law, my brother. We, we, we can't walk away from this. This is not something we walk away from. This is something we pass on. I mean, you're always going to run into the wall. It's just, can you figure out how to go under it, around it, uh, over it? That makes for longevity of a, of a business. You can't give up. You just don't let yourself give up. Watch Mama Goldtone and more documentaries about women in business in our How We Thrive series at fee.org slash shows. And we're back to the FeeCast. We are today grasping at straws, talking about various <laughs> regulations and sort of mental models that we can use to evaluate this latest scourge on our environment, which is the plastic straw, <laughs> and all of the costs associated with that. Of course, at the Foundation for Economic Education, we like to talk about economics, seeing things through the economic lens. And so my question to open up this segment is, what are the costs for actually pursuing bans on certain things such as straws? Well, well for, for one thing, you have to remember that um, even if you put something into a landfill, that yes, there, there's a cost to that. But there's also a cost to like recycling, for example, or, or there's a cost to the, the sippy cup. Like I've, I've heard, I don't, I don't know for a fact, that the sippy cup uses more plastic than um, than than the straw, and you 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 hear that a lot. You hear that where like, okay, well, the alternative uh, that we've adopted actually it has a greater environmental impact than 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 people realize. You mean a sippy cup Starbucks came out with like yes. the same? The top uses more plastic. We believe that allegedly, a straw. allegedly. the internet says yeah. that that's the case. Uh, we have yeah. the no, internet. We have not tested it in our labs yet, Marianne. <laughs> she would be the first person to know. But on that note, if you look at steel straws um, or you know whatever metal they're going to make it out of, and we talk about something more than environmental cost, we talk about actual cost. Look at the tariff war we're in right now with, right. with metals. We don't know how much those straws are going to be to you know cost to produce yeah. later and on. A steel so. straw could be made into a shiv. I mean, think of the children. children. (laughs) Well, I think there's probably a short answer to your question that's kind of annoying, which is there are the costs that we know about and the costs that we don't know about. Because when you make a policy, there's going to be consequences, and we maybe don't know what those consequences are. There's an interesting article on the Fee website about plastic bags, and it's by Brian Kaplan. It's called How Are 10 Cent Grocery Bags Creating a Surplus? And it's all about the California policy about charging 10 cents for plastic bags and how that, um, excuse me, led to a surplus of them wanting to stock these bags. And so in the end, there were more bags Mm -hmm. than they had intended. Yeah. More well, plastic bags as an unintended consequence of trying to lower the mm-hmm. number of plastic bags. Mm-hmm. 
which is funny because that's already an item that gets recycled often. With straws, I'm not reusing them twice. I use every grocery bag I've ever been given as a trash bag or something. Yeah. Like it's always mm-hmm. reused. Yeah. The recycling yeah. is there. It's yeah. happening. <laughs> My in-laws always get annoyed when I mention to them the costs of recycling, right? And so we have a partner group we work with from time to time called Perk. And they focus on environmental issues. And they talk about how uh, when you look at recycling, it actually sometimes is more wasteful Mm -hmm. to recycle things such as paper, Mm -hmm. such as plastic bottles. Because we use water and resources. Exactly. We got to strip. We got to bleach the paper. We've got to, you know, take the plastic, uh, you know, label off of whatever. Mm -hmm. The only thing that apparently is worth recycling and is not more costly to recycle than it is to extract new. Is a can? Is an aluminum can. Yeah, Mm. yeah, I heard about that. Interesting. And so, you know, everything has a cost. When you think you're doing a good job putting all of your paper into the recycling bin, that doesn't come without any kinds of uh, impact to yeah. our pocketbooks or resources that we have available. No, and to the, extent, to the extent that we have property rights and we have markets, um, costs tend to be internalized. That, that mm-hmm. um, you know, landfill, uh, owning a landfill, you know, you have to pay the cost for, you know, having that straw. And so, so that should be translated into the market. But when it's virtue signaling, then it's not really about the cost. It's just about the appearance. Wait, can you go back to the point you were trying to, when, when you were saying that the cost is internalized, can you explain that more? So, so for example, that um, you know, uh, someone who's operating a landfill, you know, they, they have to maintain the landfill. And mm-hmm. so when, the, when they, they fill it up with, with things, with straws, they have to, you know, pay for the upkeep of, of the landfill. And, and that, that land could be used for other things. Mm-hmm. So there are people bidding for the land. And, and so the prices are how we allocate scarce resources. And, and prices mm-hmm. create a tug of war for resources. And, mm-hmm. um, and so that's how we actually, we normally determine whether something is wasteful or not. Um, mm-hmm. But but once it becomes like a moral crusade, then you don't have the very subtle price mechanisms mm. telling entrepreneurs whether it's wasteful or not. It just it's just a moral panic that like okay well whether I am following the crowd on this moral panic that tells whether it's wasteful or not. So you're basically saying like we would know whether or not like straws are taking up too much space based on how much they cost for us to just use them. So it might be reflected in in this example like Starbucks their drink might increase if we're if it's going to be a straw based drink something like that whereas now we've got this almost <clears throat> we've got this like external actor which is morality or values um, distorting that very simple price price mechanism, right? I mean, that's... Well, and it's, it's a certain kind of morality in Vegas. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. It's, it's a very sort of like superficial yes. and, and very... It's just sort one step above slacktivism. It's very, kind of what exactly. I'm picturing is like, oh, it, can I can really reach say. for a straw yeah. and that's about it. So, yeah. for, so for yeah. example, in, in a private market, you know, people would have to pay for their trash service. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it wouldn't necessarily be free. It wouldn't necessarily be yeah. subsidized for the government. So, so if you... Uh, generate a lot of trash and you um you would have to pay more for for that trash service and that's right, how the, right, that, that's yeah. how the, yeah. the cost would yeah would I reach think, you I, oh, go ahead. you could even extend this to littering if i throw a trash into your yard on mm-hmm. your private property you could presumably take me to court yeah. or try to extract money from me or i could just pay you and say oh my bad here's 10 bucks <laughs> well i think you're pointing out something um let's say because there are certain there are certain communities where the government is charging you for more trash rather than yeah. um, just kind of letting you throw out whatever trash. And I think that that speaks to another kind of a way to think about solutions to this problem that are not that are not outright bans. Because right. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that sometimes we, um, from our perspective, uh, you know, we are a little bit utopian in that no government, no regulations, let's just all do whatever. But let's talk about you know kind of all of the gray areas in between that might be as economists we truly want to study. Not what's good and bad, but what's better. Mm-hmm. What, what, how can we improve on this process, well, or how can margin. we improve on yeah. the incentives? And I think the market is great is a great signal for yeah. that, right? Because what, what well, Starbucks, for example, had every right to ban you know their own straws. Mm-hmm. And maybe if I was you know hardcore environmentalist, I would buy two drinks a day from Starbucks because I want to support their efforts. Yes. But if mm-hmm. I'm not, and I see McDonald's is still selling my straws, you know, I'm voting with my dollar. So in a yeah. lot of ways, the solutions are private, you know, enterprises taking these these steps towards whatever moral or whatever you want to call it that they believe in. Um, it, it gets a little murky when you look at, like, facts. Okay, is this really damaging? Mm. But the market does wonders when it comes to private charity all the time. To your point, Anna Jane, about economists, 
economists really aren't tasked with determining what's good or bad. Right. They're tasked with sort of the science of studying how people act. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think to your point, instead of resorting to a full on ban, some of the things that economists might suggest is. Uh, or one of the things, rather, is adjusting the incentives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, we obviously, we want to preserve individual choice as much as we can, which is why outright bans or regulation can be sometimes, you know, unattractive to us. But I think that if, if you know, if we don't want to do a ban, let's try to maybe think about, or let's talk about the mechanism that's involved in, um, what am I thinking? Like vice taxes, for example, right? right? We can taxes, use, sure. yes, yeah, we can use, that's still a regulation, right? But it might be better than a ban. So let's talk about the different ways we can, if you are invested in a government entity trying mm -hmm. to enforce something, there are still better ways to do it than a ban, right? There are better ways to do it that, and uh, to me, any regulation that preserves as much individual choice as possible is always going to be better because that yeah, puts the onus on the individual exactly. to yeah. make the mm -hmm. right decision yeah. instead of being told the only decision that and he or she can make. Better in the sense of less bad. I yes, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. exactly. Well, exactly. I think there's also an important point to be made about the impact of economic development and how that correlates with the environment. We've talked about this on the FECAST before, mm -hmm. the environmental Kuznets curve, mm -hmm. which graphically, if you look at it on the y-axis is environmental degradation, on the x-axis is per capita income. And it's basically an upside down smiley face. Right. When you have low income, there's more environmental degradation. When you have higher per capita income, up to a certain point, you have more. But then past this turning point, your impact on the environment starts to decrease the higher your per capita income goes. Yeah. So. And, and to the extent that these regulations impoverish people, mm -hmm. then uh, it it keeps them from traveling along, along that Kuznets curve. Yeah. And it keeps them from getting to a point in their life where they, they value a, a luxury good like mm -hmm. environmental yeah. cleanliness. And I think we've seen evidence of this. So if you look at the four countries that produce, or that produce the most plastic in the oceans. You're looking at China, Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam. Those mm. countries all together produce more plastic waste in the ocean compared, compared to all other countries combined. Mm -hmm. And we see these as developing nations. Right. If we can get them past this turning point on the Kuznets curve, mm -hmm. we would probably see their environmental degradation decrease. Well, and so our main lesson to hope to avoid so many of the unintended consequences that you've been talking about is to preserve choice as much as possible through policy. Because we have public policy, whether someone yep. likes it or yeah. not, right? Give, put the onus on the individual. Mm -hmm. And so instead of resorting to a ban as the first course of action, actually begin to understand why people act. Think through yep. the economic lens, understand the incentives, and maybe then we can accomplish things a lot more effectively and a lot less costly. So we finished beating up these straw men here. We do have one <laughs> final thing we want to be sure to do. And given that this is Brittany's final fee cast as a regular, I'm going to pass it over to you. Yeah, so just to pass the proverbial baton or torch, I'm going to hand or pass my mug <laughs> over to you to symbolize... Oh, well. <laughs> I was going to say the regime change? I don't know. It's somewhat of a regime change, yeah. <laughs> but welcome to the fee cast. Oh, I expect thank you. great things from thank you. you. Oh, thank you very much. Honor it my is, memory. <laughs> it is, though you be tiny, it is a large shadow that I am living in. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I, I think I love talking to you guys. You know that. Um, if only there was a straw in my drink. Um, but yeah. We'll work on it for next time here. if we can find one. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for watching the FeeCast. We'll see you next week. <laughs>